audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Welcome to Leading the Way with pastor and international Bible teacher, Dr. Michael Youssef. Up next, Dr. Youssef continues his series, How Shall We Live Now? A challenge for Christians to be light in the darkness around us. Hey, please remember that Leading the Way has several resources free for the asking. You'll find them at ltw.org. Click on the store, scroll down and click on Free Digital Resources. The page will populate with items for free that will equip you to have a life of faith impacting those around you and tools to guide you deeper in your Christian walk. ltw.org Wait until later though because right now, Dr. Yusuf is beginning today's message. Anger and discontentment and restlessness has been from the very beginning of humanity. Back all the way in Genesis, when man chose to be in the city of man instead of being in the city of God. From that time on, humanity has been either running away from something or running to look for something. Every survey that I saw, and I look, I stay on, on top of things, less than 5% of the population truly can say they are contented and satisfied in life. In fact, I thought this illustrated in the story I read about a tombstone in Sussex, England. It was two tombstones between a husband and a wife. And the tombstone on the wife's graveside said, she died for want of things. Right next to her, the husband's tombstone read, he died trying to give them to her. (laughs) (laughs) Restlessness, discontentment is going to be on the increase as we come toward the end of time. Hear me right, please. If there is one thing that distinguishes between those who belong to the city of God and those who belong to the city of man, it is that whole issue of anxiety and restlessness and discontentment. There are other things, but this is one, and that is why Jesus repeatedly told His followers, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be like them, restless and discontented. In the midst of this growing darkness and oppression, how shall we live now? Those of us who belong to the city of God, those of us who are citizens of heaven, those of us who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, but for now we are living in the city of man, here on earth, how shall we not just survive, but thrive? I want to begin by showing you how this separation between two distinct cities, the city of God and the city of man, began in the Bible. And so, I'll be following Genesis 3, 4, and 5. From the very beginning, there has been two humanities made up of two cities or two cultures. In fact, that distinction runs in a trace throughout the Scripture. These two cities have two distinct origins. These two cities, the city of God and the city of man, they have two distinct developments. These two cities, they have two distinct characteristics. These two cities, yes, have two distinct destinations. The earthly city or the city of man symbolized by Babylon and Rome, and even Western civilization today. The other heavenly city is symbolized by the elect of God from every nation, from every tribe, from every generation. They represent the new Jerusalem, the city of God that will be coming down from heaven for the believers. The city of man will be destroyed, make no mistake about it, but the city of God will never, never, never be destroyed. First, there are two offsprings of two distinct humanities. Those two humanities are found in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. God told the serpent in the Garden of Eden, I will put an enmity between you and the woman. I will put an enmity between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike at his heels. Now, of course, the ultimate descendant of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 to 6 makes it very clear. The descendant of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tried to strike at his heel, but he failed. But on the cross, Jesus crushed his head. And he rendered him ineffective for all of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are these two humanities? The descendants of the serpent. Of course, Satan cannot have descendants because he's a spiritual being, couldn't have natural descendants. So the natural descendants are the ones who follow him. And the descendants of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I who love the Lord Jesus. Everyone who follows Satan in disobedience to God is a descendant of the serpent. This distinction between the two, or this enmity between the two, is carried forward in Genesis chapter 4 and in Genesis chapter 5. It just continued. The first evidence that Adam and Eve believed God, trusted God, when He said to them that the descendant of the woman is going to come and is going to crush the serpent, the very evidence why they believed God, took Him at His word, is the naming of their first son. What was the name of their first son? Cain. Do you know what Cain means? Here he is. (laughs) Here he is. They thought, this is the one. The descendant of the woman who's going to crush the serpent's head. They didn't realize that they're going to have to wait for a few thousand years until the descendant of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, come on the scene. When Cain and Abel were fully grown, you see that distinction between them so clearly. (laughs) You see that enmity between the two of them is very clear. One followed Satan in disobedience to God, and the other one followed God. That distinction became emphatically clear because Cain rejected God, and he wanted to come to God his way. You see, when God slay a lamb to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve with the skin, he was teaching them what the Bible later said, that there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood, that the only sacrifice acceptable to God is the shedding of an innocent blood. But Cain said, I know what God said. I know what God wants. I want to come to God my way. I'm going to bring Him some groceries. I'm going to bring Him grains. And thus, the disobedience began. But God does not walk away from Cain. He reasons with him. Look at it in the Scripture. He reasons with him. And His desire is for Cain to repent of his sin and turn and say, I'm sorry, I killed my brother. I am sorry I sinned against you. I'm sorry I tried to come to you my way. But he didn't. You see, there's one characteristic about our God that I don't want you to miss, and I'm going to share it a lot more in the coming days. Because in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. God always trying to reason, even with the non-believers. He's always trying to reason with those who are living in the city of man. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's our God. That's our God. Himirat, please don't miss this. (laughs) This is an implied lesson for all of us who belong to the city of God and living in the city of man. How shall we live now? We look at things that are getting darker and getting darker. We look at the Justice Department suing schools for not allowing perversion in the bathrooms and in the locker rooms. We're seeing things that we never dreamed that we will see in our lifetime. How shall we live now? God is showing us that we cannot just wring our hands and say, it is hopeless, it is hopeless, there's nothing we can do. God's character is revealed to us here that we cannot just head for the mountains, put on white robes, and wait for the rapture. We cannot just write off humanity and walk away. No, but like our God, we must reason with everyone who would listen to us. We must reason with everyone in the city of man. We must show them the light of Christ that is shining shining in us and through us. We must be salt that will create thirst in their life for Christ. We must be a light. You can be light and you can be salt without having to be one of them. Jesus said, you are in the world, but not of it. Stay the course. Stay the course. Why? Because, make no mistake about it, those from among them 
who are appointed unto salvation. We don't know who they are. We don't have the book of life with us. Those from among them who are appointed unto salvation, they will come. They will be impacted by our testimony, and they will come and they will join us. Back to the city. Not only there were two distinct humanities, but those two distinct humanities, they've created two distinct cultures or two distinct cities. That's the whole idea of the city of God versus the city of man, according to St. Augustine. You see, after Cain killed his brother Abel and lied about it, after Cain refused to accept the reasoning of God who was trying to reason with him, Cain became afraid, and he went out, and the Bible said he went out and built a city. Beloved, listen to me. (laughs) This is the epitome of the city of man. It is filled with fear and anxiety and restlessness. Cain built the very first city of man. Cain built a place to escape from God, where people think they can hide from God. Cain built a city for people to pretend that God does not exist. He built the city in order that be easy to revolt against God, a place to outlaw any vision of God. And in Genesis 4.15, I said 3.15, now it's 4.15, so keep that in your memory. In 4.15, God told Cain that his fate, not his faith, fate, F-A-T-E, his fate is pain and torment of conscience, restlessness, and anxiety. Let me ask you, do you know why? Do you know why? Do you know why even today so many anti-Christian forces, and we have so many anti-biblical leaders who are issuing edicts, anti-Christian edicts, (laughs) they're issuing anti-biblical edicts. They are destroying morality in society. Do you know why? Because their conscience are burning inside of them. They may be pretend to be cool and wise. They may pretend to be anti-discrimination, uh, but in reality, they are like Cain. They are building cities and cultures that defies God. They are seething inside of them with anxiety and restlessness and fear, and they're transforming that to the rest of the culture. Hear me right on this one. The city of man creates perverted pleasures. Pleasure is a gift of God. God created pleasure. God gave us pleasure. But the perverted pleasure is the creation of Satan and man in the city of man. The city of man is filled with entertainment to help relieve their burning conscience. The city of man has created some hassle and bustle in order to occupy our minds. The city of man delves deeply into all sorts of businesses to occupy our time so that we have no time to be convicted of our sin. The city of man is filled with drugs and alcohol in order to numb our guilt. But make no mistake about it. Hear me right, please. There is nothing, nothing, nothing. Can you say nothing? Nothing will muzzle the voice of God. And that is why when you represent the nationality of your proverbial city of God, when you represent the absolutes of the city of God, when you represent the voice of God, you bear the brunt of their anger toward God. (laughs) You know how in sales training they tell you when somebody doesn't buy your stuff, don't take it personally? They just don't like your product. This is to help prop up salespeople. I'm not trying to prop you up. I'm telling you the truth, okay? Listen to me. (laughs) When you're attacked for your faith in Jesus Christ, you're getting somebody else's mail. Don't take it personally. That is one time you should not take it personally (laughs) because you're getting God's mail. (laughs) And when you keep on standing firm, refusing to budge, God said there is a reward for you that is indescribable. Genesis 4.16 said that Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod. That's N-O-D. Do you know what Nod means? Wandering around. That's what Nod means. He went in the land of wandering around, wandering around, wandering around. 
and wandering around, aimlessly wandering around. Believe me when I tell you that they will never be happy. They will never be satisfied. No matter how much they try to receive acceptance and approval and even creating it to be a virtue, they will never be happy. Never. It's going to get the bottom, another bottom, another bottom. They keep going deeper and deeper and deeper in the mud of sin. When Israel kept on doing that, kept on creating new bottoms and new bottoms, prophet after prophet, 200 years, turn to me, come back to me, repent, trust me. I am the one who did all this for you in the past. Come back to me. And finally, when they would not do this, God said, I'm just going to take my hands off. That's all he did. He took his hands off, and the Babylonians came and swept across. And you know the rest of the story. And that is why God burned me with this message, and that's why I'm appealing to every member of the city of God, living in the city of man, to never shrink from standing firm, to never shrink from speaking the truth in love, to never shrink from being a light, not an amber, to be a salt, not a dust, at a time when we are seeing so many people giving up and they have joined the current of culture, when at the time when we are seeing some professing Christians are living for self and self-indulgence and self-pleasing, you and I who know God, you and I who know the Word of God, you and I who know God's character, must say with Joshua, as for me and my household, we shall worship the Lord. But we need to do more than that. We need to be like Noah, appealing to everyone who would listen. Escape now while escaping is good. Escape now while escaping is possible. But the Bible shows us that that godless culture of Cain runs through many generations, and it gets worse and worse by generations. Each subsequent generation got worse than the previous one until we come to Lamech. Lamech is the prototype of a self-made man. But thankfully, the Bible also tells us about Enoch. Mercifully, we have role models in the Scripture. Enoch. The contrast between Lamech and Enoch is a contrast between those who belong to the city of God and those who belong to the city of man. While Lamech exalted himself, Enoch was a man who walked with God. While Lamech was self-sufficient, did not need God, Enoch feared God. While Lamech killed people for the smallest offense, and then he went around bragging about it, Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. Two distinct humanities, two distinct cities, two distinct cultures. One depended on God, and the other one rejected God. No wonder Hebrews 11, verse 5 said, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He was commended as one who pleased God. May this be said of you. Oh, may this be said of me. What does it mean to walk with God? Listen carefully. It means not only to believe in God, but to believe God. Take him at his word. It means to obey God regardless of the consequences. It means to be close to God. It means to seek to live for God and not for the cultural mores. When it says Enoch walked with God, it means that Enoch did not fight against God, that Enoch did not resist the precepts of God, that Enoch did not try to water down or try to modify the word of God, but rather... Enoch found joy in obeying God and in his revelation. Oh, Lord, that we may love God more than we love acceptance by man, that we would want to please God far above trying to please anybody else, that we would delight more in fearing God than in fearing the powerful in our culture and our society, that we would crave more to honor God than to honor ourselves. 
that we would consider being scorned for the sake of Christ as a badge of honor and not something to be ashamed of. Cain refused to obey God and God's way. And he would not offer that animal sacrifice that his parents taught him to do. He wanted to come to God his own way. And his fate was wandering around, fumbling and stumbling in the city of man. He did not know where he was going. His fate was restlessness and discontentment and wandering. I was reading just this week about the inaugural speech by FDR. He said, we don't know where we're going, but we are on our way. That's about right. (laughs) That's about right. In the city of man, there is restlessness, loneliness. There is rootlessness. Isn't that amazing? When you look at the Scripture, particularly chapter 4, verse 12, he's warning Cain ahead of time. He's warning him ahead of time. And he said to him, he said, the you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. End of quote. Listen to what Cain said. (laughs) You see, those people who modify the Word of God, they'll modify the Word of God wherever they go. He modified the Word of God. Two verses down, Cain complained that I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And then he adds something. And whoever finds me will kill me. (laughs) God didn't tell him that. See, by the time you get to chapter 6, verse 5, in the book of Genesis, you hear God to be saying, man's wickedness has become very great, and every inclination of the thought of his heart was only evil all the time. Thus God called Noah. He said, Noah, you reason with them. You call the wicked to escape while the escaping is good. God has placed you in neighborhoods. He placed you in schools. He placed you on campuses. He placed you in your workplace. He posted you in the office or the factory, wherever you may be. He placed you there to be a Noah. God does not call us to run away from the city of man. No! He called us to invite others before it's too late to come to the city of God. But you will not be able to do this if you're living like them. If you're anxious like them, if you're worried like them, if you're restless like them, if you're discontented like them, and I'm not saying it's easy, but with God, all things are possible. He will encourage you. He will stand with you. All he needs you to say like, Noah, yes, Lord, give me the strength, and I'll do it. I'll stand firm, regardless of the cost. This is Leading the Way. The Practical Bible Teaching of Dr. Michael Youssef. Learn more about the reach of this ministry at ltw.org. I'm uh, Reverend Sammy Mitri. I'm the pastor of uh, Living Water Arabic Church, our church based in Ealing, uh, West London. And uh, we're so happy to have uh, Al Malakut Channel and the homes of our people. I have it in my home myself. I found teaching, very good teaching. For me, it was like a Bible study because I'm watching it every single day. So when he is speaking, every time I feel he is feeding my spirit. Some other cities in in, in UK and England, uh, Wales, um, Scotland, they have a lot of Arabs and they don't have an Arabic church. So the only source of the Word of God is to uh, have the channels. In Malakot, one of the uh, great channels and source of, uh, of the Word of God and teaching the Word of God. He catches the two culture actually because when he speaks, uh, I feel he's in our place. The name is really uh, a good name for this channel. It's a kingdom of God. My room is in Malakot, really. I am in the kingdom of the Lord in my house. The channel is a great blessing to millions of Arab speaking people in the UK and in Europe as well. The Kingdom Sat celebrates 15 years of ministry this month. Find out more about the worldwide reach and impact when you visit ltw.org. This program is furnished by Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. Thanks.
Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.